So today is actually, it, it's a training day. Some of the things that we're going to be covering today is we're going back to the basics. What actually is a clinical trial? What are the phases of clinical trials? What is clinical care versus clinical research? Because there's there is quite a distinction there. Um, what are the clinical trial regulations governing us in Canada? And also what are the international regulations? What are some of the ethical principles guiding the conduct of clinical research? And then finally, um, how do I submit to the REB? And so day two will follow up from submitting to the REB and it's actually once you have your study approved, what are some of the things that you need to consider when you're when you're actually running your clinical trial? So as I mentioned, it is a workshop um, and these are all the things that we hope to accomplish today. It's a two hour workshop, maybe it may not take us two hours. Um, but if it does, that's great. If it doesn't, you know, get back some time in your day. I just wanted to start out with the HRPP organizational chart. So the HRPP is the Human Research Protection Program, and it is a pro program that sort of governs the, the oversight of all research conducted within Horizon. There is actually a formalized structure to it, as you can see, to the uh, um, in accordance with the organizational chart. So we do have uh, the institutional authority for the HRPP is Dr. Susan Breen. Um, and under Dr. Susan Breen is the Regional Director of Research Services, uh, the Regional Director of Ethics Services. And then there's myself uh, sort of overseeing the, the, um, the ORS for the or Office of Research Services side of the HRPP. So we have Stella's role as QA auditor within the HRPP. We have administrative support. We have the regulatory review process, which I'm responsible for. And we also have the HRPP methods review. And so that, that is sort of the upfront review. And I think a lot of you are familiar with it now because it's been in place since 2018. So our research study application comes in and ORS component of HRPP or Office of Research Services kind of does its initial review, looking at privacy, methodology, um, education and training. Also contracts review is a very important process of that as well. Once those things are initially started and reviewed, then um, we send it off to REB and then REB does its, uh, does its thing with the research study applications. So I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of a background on what the HRPP is, because I think a few of you, <coughs> excuse me, on the call are, are new to research and may not necessarily be as familiar with our process. So our research services team, as I already introduced, Stella, quality assurance manager, there's myself, there's Dr. Bryn Robinson, who's research engagement manager, but Bryn also plays a role right now in the operations of our Romeo platform, which is the online submission platform for research study applications. Um, and then we have Corinne Morin, I think Corinne's on the call today, and Corinne's our contract and budget manager. So Corinne looks after all of the agreements relating to, uh, to your clinical research projects and clinical trials. And then Katie, um, Katie is our administrative assistant and Katie would help troubleshoot any kind of access with, with Romeo. Um, you need to set up a, an account or if you need a new password, those types of things. So I just wanted to make sure you had our contact information um, in case you run into any kind of issues or you had any questions, this is who you would reach out to. So back to why we're here today. So why do research teams need training? Well, there's a number of guidelines and regulations that emphasize the importance of education, research education and training. And TCPS2 is actually the Tri-Council Policy Statement 2, and those are the ethical guidelines governing the conduct of research in Canada. The newest version now is actually 2018, so I apologize, I don't have my, <clears throat> my, up my updated date in there. But TCPS2 specifies that in institutions that receive tri-agency funds must comply with TCPS2. In order to comply with TCPS2, you have to demonstrate that you've had training and you can get training such as this and also through their core tutorial, which is available for free online. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Health Canada also makes it a requirement that each individual involved in clinical trial is qualified by by education, training, and experience. 
the FDA as well in the US, uh, qualifications showing education and training and experience is required, and also ICHGCPs stipulates that each individual involved in clinical trial is qualified by education, training, and experience. So this will certainly contribute to your, your sort of training docket because you will get a certificate at the end of this training session that you'll be able to put in your, in your training file. I wanted to talk a little bit before we dive into phases of clinical trials about clinical care versus clinical research, because this um, this really is an issue, not an issue, it's it's a, a major component when you have clinicians that are also doing clinical research. So it really goes back to what the core purpose is of clinical research, and that is to generate generalizable knowledge useful for future patients, whereas medical care or clinical care aims to provide um, care to promote the well-being of individual patients. So you can see how this dichotomy creates that ethical conflict or tension potentially for physicians or clinicians who have that dual role. So as clinicians, we must keep the patient's interests at foremost, but as researchers, we must subordinate that individual patient interest to the general interests of the community. So we'll talk about this a little bit more, but you, you'll see how you can sort of mitigate um, this tension by, you know, perhaps bringing in an, another member of the team to do your informed consent process uh, and those types of things. But I just wanted to make that distinction because even though we try as much as possible to embed clinical research into clinical care, there is that tension that will exist because the purpose of each is very distinct and very different. So what is a clinical trial? So according to GCP, E6R2. So GCP is good clinical practice, and the good clinical practice guideline was published first back in 1997, and it's actually the international standard which governs the conduct of clinical research. So it defines a clinical study as an investigation in human subjects intended to discover or confirm effects of an investigational product. So it's also um, intended to, or a clinical trial can observe for any adverse effects or to evaluate how the product um, reacts in the body. How does it work and how does it say, um, and is it safe? So the term clinical trial and clinical study are actually synonymous. So what are the phases of clinical trials? So a phase one clinical trial is actually called first in man. <clears throat> so what, what clinical trial objectives for phase one is to make sure that new, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm gonna mute myself for just one second. Sorry about that, everybody. So phase one clinical trials are intended to make sure that new medicines present no major safety issues. They can clarify, um, what the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of, of a medication. They're actually used just to see what a, what a drug does. So they're healthy volunteers. They give them an investigational product. They do the ADME. They just want to see where it goes and what it does. So it gives them that preliminary evidence that could offer therapeutic value or, or prevent disease or condition. It's usually given in, in less than 100 people. The fewer the number, the better. Um, and in order to get their intended results because they just don't know what it's going to do. In some cases, you will see that phase one clinical trials are given in a specific disease such as cancer because, as you can imagine, it wouldn't be ethically appropriate to give uh, healthy volunteers um, chemotherapeutic agents. Phase two clinical trials. Phase two are control clinical studies where the new study drug or treatment is given to a larger group of participants, typically around 100 to 300 people. So really the objectives are to figure out if something works. So primarily that's what they want to, what they want to see. They kind of know what the ADME is from phase one. Now they want to see if it actually works in a specific disease state. So they give it to people who have that diagnosis or that disease. 
and they want to see if it works. And if it does, what dose does it work at? So phase two typically has different different dosing regimens that you'll see, and they do a number of pharmacokinetic testing, lots of blood testing, um, just to uh, to determine what the side effects potentially could be. So they're primarily for phase two is does it work and what's the preliminary safety information on it. Phase three is typically what we see here in Horizon. So phase three clinical trials, um, these are larger phase studies. They usually have anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 patients that they, participants that they put on study. And really what the, the objectives of phase three, phase three is to just confirm that the, the uh, medication actually works. It's, uh, it's get, um, gathering additional side effect information. It can also compare it in, or in combination with other drugs. So you'll see that it's compared to standard of care or it's given a combination with standard of care. Um, so really want to see more about its safety and efficacy and look at the risk benefit ratio. Phase three studies have different levels too. A phase three B means that they're collecting the final information in order to submit to the regulatory authorities for approval. Um, and that's called uh, in it, a new drug application or an NDA. So we do a lot of phase three studies here in Horizon. We have done a couple of phase one studies here in the oncology patient population, and we've done a number of phase two studies as well, also in hematologic oncology, oncology population. Um, and just to go back to, to phase two for a second, so most, most trials actually Will, will not pass phase phase two um, for a number of reasons, but mostly because they're looking at whether or not it works. It's mostly because it's ineffective or it has intolerable side effects. Phase four studies, we do a number of these in Horizon as well. So these are post-marketing studies. So this is after the drug has already received approval and it's already on the market. So these studies are really intended just to gather more safety information. Um, they could also be required through regulatory authority. Maybe Health Canada has issued a notice of compliance with conditions, which means that they have an obligation, that the sponsor has an obligation to collect longer term sort of uh, safety and efficacy data on this marketed drug. So this entire process can take many, many years. A typical patent on a molecule starting back, you know, preclinical um, before it even gets to phase one is around 20 years. So for, and for every 25,000 compounds that start in, in the lab, 25 are tested in humans. So the success rate is, is not it's not that great. And actually, uh, five of those 25 make it to market. And to re recoup the cost of these clinical trials can be in the billions of dollars. So this is why we see drugs that make it to market, especially some of these newer bio biologic drugs that are hugely expensive. So um, with the high cost of current drug development, coupled with the trends towards complex medicines and the use of genomic markers to predict response, in the future we may see a more flexible drug development and regulatory framework. So this is certainly the, the, uh, the case with COVID-19. Um, there was a trend towards not, I mean, the oversight definitely was there. It maintained the oversight, but what happened was there was the an expedited process for clinical trial application review that Health Canada adopted. And they are actually now are um, undertaking a modernization of their clinical trials regulations, which started before COVID-19, but it was certainly, um, you know, certainly thrust uh, into a higher priority post-COVID-19. Um, post so, you know, approval processes take 14 days now instead of uh, 30 for, um, an application review and those types of things. So we'll, we'll see more modernization happening within the next couple of years of the regulations. Just before I move into clinical trial designs, does anybody have any questions on content so far? Um, so Jacqueline, there was a question in the chat box asking about uh, if there's been any uh, 
if we've been involved in phase one and two trials in Horizon Health Network. So my answer to that question what, um, was that I said we haven't done a whole lot of phase one just yet, but we've done lots of phase two and three mm -hmm. so far. Yeah. Um, if there's anything you would want to add, add to that question, feel free to do that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. And I think I, I had mentioned that too, that it's mostly within the uh, oncology domain is where we have done uh, the phase one trials, but they're very few and far between because as you can probably imagine, they're quite labor intensive mm -hmm. um, because they are looking specifically at what this what this drug does. They would have data from the animal model, but we're moving into uh, into humans at this point. So it's pretty... Um, it's pretty resource and uh, intensive and, and very close monitoring is required of participants. And you can imagine what the informed consent process would look like um, with, a, uh, with a phase one study. So there'd be a lot of support and education and training that goes into the prepping the team and also in support of research participants and, and of course their families. Um, so uh, yeah. There's, we, we, we don't do very, very many of them, um, but we, we have certainly done a few, that's for sure. Yeah, well, great question. And again, please feel free to unmute or, or put your hand up and, and uh, with any questions along the way. Just moving into clinical trial designs. Um, so this is the most common design that we see here in Horizon. And just to give you a little bit of context, we have approximately 130 study applications per year, anywhere between 130 and 150, and roughly 35, around 35, 30 to 35 of those clinical trials, and they are um, external sponsors. So with uh, Merck or Bayer, um, you know, Sanofi, those kinds of clinical trials uh, sponsors, these are the groups that, that, that we work with the most. Um, and the rest of them are learner research investigator initiated um, non non interventional clinical research non drug trial research. So that's just to give you a little bit of context. But when we do work in in clinical trials with our pharmaceutical partners, the most common design that we'll see is that parallel group design. So and because they're phase three studies, right? It makes the most sense to do. A confirmatory trial where your research participants are randomized to one or two treatment arms and each arm is allocated to a different treatment. So these treatments include the investigational product of one or more of the doses um, or, uh, or added on to standard of care in the control group right. or they have an active um, an active comparator or they actually or they have a placebo control arm. So there's a number of ethical considerations around placebo control trials. Um, the REB looks pretty closely at those, but if the placebo means it wasn't part of standard of care in the first place, there's less of a consideration. Placebo control when you're withholding standard of care is when the REB has to really look at it and consider whether or not, you know, it, it's ethically appropriate for that type of design to be uh, um, to be given to research participants. Um, the crossover design is each subject, which now the, the term is really moving towards participant, um, but these are uh, guidelines that are kind of old. And actually, I want to just refer you back to um, E9. So GCP E9 is st statistical considerations and research, just for your reference, if you want to take a look at these. So in the crossover design, um, each participant is randomized to a sequence of two or more treatments, and therefore they act as their own sort of internal control. Um, in the simplest two by two crossover design, each participant receives each of the two treatments in a randomized way in two successive periods, and then often um, separated by a washout period. I haven't seen these as much anymore. Um, as I mentioned, parallel group design is, is probably the most common design and, and, and because they're phase three. So confirmatory, gathering the data in order to send it off to the regulatory authorities for approval. I wanted to mention adaptive design because we saw a lot of adaptive design um, during COVID-19. 
So this is a really flexible design and the clinical trial regulations, Health Canada and FDA kind of struggled with how to provide that appropriate regulatory oversight because it was changing so quickly. The treatment arms were changing so quickly. So I did make reference to an FDA guidance document that you might want to take a look at if you're of interest in learning a little bit more about adapted design. So it's a clinical trial that allows for prospectively planned modifications um, with that parallel design with any um, randomized double blind placebo controlled study. It's pretty rigid in what the, uh, the design is going to be or what the treatments are going to be. With adaptive design, it allows you to make modifications to whatever your treatments are, arms are based on the evidence that's being submitted for consideration. So it really allows you to, to make those changes quickly. Um, if you want a reference as to what an adaptive design would look like or a platform trial is another type of uh, trial design, um, take a look at the CATCO study. That was a COVID-19 study. So as we saw initially, remdesivir was looked positive for the treatment of COVID-19. As additional data came in about the effectiveness of remdesivir, was, you know, it was dropped um, as a treatment arm for COVID-19. Convalescent plasma was another treatment consideration, um, you know, those types of things. So it allows for that continuous review and evaluation of the data as it comes in and then for you to make adaptations or changes to the treatments that are based on that, um, on that information. Stepped wedge is another one that I wanted to talk about because stepped wedge doesn't necessarily involve drugs. It can involve an intervention and stepped wedge trials are relatively new. We haven't done many within Horizon. We have been asked to participate in a couple. So uh, stepped wedge cluster randomized trials are really commonly used for the evaluation of a service or a policy intervention, you know, say you wanted to implement some kind of a new um, hand washing policy or something like that. So the design includes that initial period in which no one in the cluster receives the intervention and subsequently at various intervals, each one of the groups within that cluster will end up being exposed to the evaluation or the intervention. And so that by the end, when you reach the end of the, the step, it actually looks like a step if you, you know, to see it depicted in a, in a diagram. So at the end of, of the, the observation period, everybody within that cluster receives the intervention. Um, so it's an interesting way to do um, that kind of evaluation on some kind of a, you know, like a, a larger group intervention. Um, and it is becoming more and more popular. So the data collection does continue throughout the study, as I mentioned, so that each cluster contributes to observations under both the control as a control and both uh, as inter intervention observation periods. But of course, at different, uh, um, each group is, has a different time to exposure of the intervention. And the multi-center trials. So the ones that we do are here, the, the industry-sponsored ones or the pharmaceutical company-sponsored ones are multi-center trials. So, of course, um, there's a couple of reasons why there's an interest in doing multi-center trials. Um, you, of course, you can get patients on quickly, as I talked about. It's a 20-year process from, from, from bench to, to market. So to get patients um, exposed to the drug and to determine its efficacy um, and get it to market as quickly as possible means you have to put the number of patients on study that you need in order to demonstrate that you know it's, it, it has a positive outcome. So with multi-center studies, with sites from around the world, you can put patients on quickly, um, but you can see how doing that, it's really important to make sure that the conduct of clinical trial at every individual site is conducted in a uniform and standardized way. So what are the Canadian regulations and guidelines that we're subject to? So we're operating under Health Canada's Food and Drug Regulations, Division 5, Part C. We're operating under the Natural Health Products Regulations, Part 
for if we're doing investigational trials with natural health products. And we're also operating and subject to the MDR regulations part three or the medical device regulations part three. So these are just the Canadian uh, regulations. If we're doing international trials, of course, we're, we're subject to FDA, to the US regulations as well, but we'll talk about those a little bit further. Some of the other Canadian guidelines, and I mentioned this earlier, is the Tri-Council Policy Statement. I see I have the correct date here, 2018. So the Tri-Council Policy Statement is the ethical guideline for conduct of research involving humans. So it's a joint policy that was released by the tri-agencies, so the three federal funding research agencies, which is CIHR, NSERC, and SHRC. Um, so they through their, um, their responsible conduct of research office on the panel of research ethics, they determined that in order for them to release funds, they wanted to ensure that these funds were being used in research in an ethical manner. So they, they put together the Tri-Council policy statement as a guideline to follow um, for research using tri-agency funds. So Horizon is now an eligible institution to receive funding from the tri-agency. So therefore, we are obligated to comply with, um, with the guidelines as established by the Tri-Council Policy Statement. So there's, there are a number of chapters in the TCPS, but Chapter 11 specifically is on clinical trials. So, and it discusses some of the potential ethical issues associated with clinical trial conduct, and some specifically are, um, it talks about clinical equipoise. And I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with what we mean when we talk about clinical equipoise. But what that means is that at the outset of a clinical trial, there has to be a genuine uncertainty among the expert community about what interventions are most effective for a given condition. So what that means is um, there's equitable and there's there's balance. So you can't unfairly assign research participants to a treatment arm that you know to be inferior. So the the expert clinical community has to be in agreement that that randomize it, randomization to either one of the treatment arms is not going to unfairly disadvantage one or the other treatment groups. It has to be balanced. And this is actually based on the principle of justice. And we're going to talk about the eth ethical principles a little bit later. But the, the principle of justice tries to ensure that no one group should fare better than another. The other thing that they talk about is duty, duty of care. And we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. So it's clinical care versus clinical research. And so physicians or clinicians have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interest of their individual patient when they are providing care. Um, when in research, as we talked about earlier, there's a different purpose. So research is really for societal good, care is for individual, is, is intended for the individual good. So um, we always must act in the best interests of our patients and try to mitigate the tension that is created when we are, as clinicians are also acting in the role of a researcher. And then there's also the uh, therapeutic misconception. And I know this is a question that's asked when you do your REB application. So what therapeutic misconception means is that some patients may confused may confuse participating in a clinical trial with receiving care, especially if it's presented by their treating physician. Um, so we have to be careful to mitigate this therapeutic misconception because some patients will say, well, if you're mentioning it to me as my doctor, it must be okay. So the way that you would help to mitigate that is to bring in another member of your research study team to actually do the informed consent process. Um, so there are ways there are ways to manage it, and there's that confirmatory um, conversation you can have after the informed consent to say, can you read back to me or tell me what participating in this study means to you? 
um, just so that they to make sure that they understand uh, what they're what they're agreeing to. I mentioned there's international regulations and guidelines. So as we talked about, GCP is good clinical practice. E6, um, E6 refers to the section of GCP, so its efficacy is what E stands for. And R2 is the newest revision that was published a couple of years ago and was initially released in 1997. Hadn't been updated for 20 years. And then they um, made some amendments to it and released it, I think it was 2017, something like that. But it was initially established by the International Conference on Harmonization in 1997. And the Declaration of Helsinki formed the basis for the ethical principles that underlie the, the GCP guidelines. So essentially it is, an, it is an international standard for all clinical trials involving drugs when generating clinical trial data that's intended for submission to regulatory authorities. So before GCP, everybody was kind of doing their own thing. And if they wanted to submit their data to another country for approval of that drug in that country, they they couldn't do it. They they had to um, there was pushback because it, the study wasn't conducted in that country. So that's why this International Conference on Harmonization came together and said, you know, so that we can accept data across international lines why don't we establish a standard that everybody is required to adhere to so that we can ensure that participants are safe and also that the data that's generated through these clinical trials has integrity and that we can accept it. So that's where kind of the origins of GCP and where it came from. Um, so we also have the Division 5 in natural health products states that trials must be conducted um, in accordance with GCP, it's actually mentioned in there, and the MDR, the medical device regulation, follows the ISO standard. So that's ISO stands for International Standards Organization, and um, it's a, an organization that develops standards. So their standard they developed for device trials is number 14155, and it actually incorporates or has a section that summarizes GCP principles. And it, and it mentions uh, the de Declaration of Helsinki as well. So for GCP, they, there are 13 core principles. And those are listed here. So as I mentioned, the ethical principles, which are grounded in the Declaration of Helsinki, um, the risk benefit. So what that means is the benefits, the risk of the study cannot outweigh the potential benefits that the rights and safety of participants is the utmost importance, that there's preclinical information to support the drug in the clinical research study so that, you know, it's it's got some animal data to support bringing it into, into uh, or introducing it into humans, that the clinical trial is scientifically sound and that there is a sound, that there's a protocol that accompanies it that that protocol is already be approved, that medical care is provided by a qualified physician or a qualified dentist, that individuals involved in the conduct of the trial are qualified to do their delegated responsibilities, that informed consent is given freely and without undue inducement, that data that's collected is accurate and stored and handled to ensure its accuracy and to ensure its integrity, that confidential information that's gathered or information that could identify participants is handled in the utmost of confidential ways, that the medication or drugs used in the study are handled in accordance with good manufacturing practices and in accordance with the protocol, and that there is quality or systems and procedures that assure the quality of every aspect of the trial should be implemented. Um, so these are the 13 core principles in GCP and every section or everything that you're asked to do when your monitor or when your sponsor comes relates specifically back to one of these um, core principles. And really what it relates back to is participant safety and data integrity. So everything that you're asked to do, you can pin it back to one of those two points. Results of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Um, and they have the Code of Federal Regulations. So specifically, there are parts, uh, Title 21, Parts 11, 50, 56, 312, 
And then there's also OHRP's uh, common rule or is uh, 45 CFR 46. We are subject to OHRP 45 CFR 46 in that we do studies that are funded through the Department of Health and Human Services through um, the oncology group. So therefore, we're obligated to be compliant with those regulations as well. If you sign a 1572, then we, then what that does is it, it tests to the fact that we are compliant with the CFR regulations. There's some concern about whether or not we should be signing 1572s. And I know Stella through N2 group is working on a position statement, I think, for sites to adopt as to whether or not it's appropriate for us to sign a 1572. Um, right now, I don't say that you can't sign it. If you don't want to sign it, you can let that know, let your sponsors know. Um, you can at least request a waiver of Part 56, and that's the IRB, because essentially what it's asking the investigator to attest to all these things that the RAB does with what it says it's going to do. So if you consider the RAB a vendor or providing a service, um, you know, then they're, they're saying, well, well, I as PI or qualified investigator will make sure that the RAB does what it says it's going to do. If you don't want to do that, um, or if you don't think it's appropriate to do that, then you can request a waiver of Part 56. And I would actually suggest that uh, that you do do that. Have these conversations early on with your sponsor, because just about every clinical trial that we do is based out of the U.S. Um, have a conversation with them about whether or not they sh they can be listed. You we can be listed as a non-U.S. site, and um, if not. If they ask you to, to attest to sign a separate document attesting to the REB's operations, I'd request a waiver of Part 56. And we can help you out with all that. If you ever run into that, just let us know. For right now, don't be concerned with signing a 1572. And again, this is Section 312.120 um, if you're a non US site but that's only if they submit you under that section and nine times out of 10, they, they won't because it's a lot more paperwork for them. And essentially what a 1572 does is it permits drug to come across the border. Um, it puts all that information that they need to send to the FDA to say, okay, you know, St. John New Brunswick's good. You can now ship your drug across the border. It's safe to do it. Any questions on that section before we move on? Danny, Stella? Um, I don't see any questions being asked in the chat box, but if anybody um, can just uh, unmute yourself and feel free to do that as well. So. No? Okay. Um, so now I'm going to move into the ethical principles and some of the origin of the ethical principles governing the conduct of, of research. So the first thing I want, the first one I want to talk about is the Nuremberg Code that was released in 1947. So the Nuremberg Code was actually in response to the atrocities of Nazi Germany. Um, and so despite it being issued in 1947, there continued to be many unethical research studies um, continued, and one of them is Tus Tuskegee, which I'll mention um, in a few minutes. Um, but as we know, one of the one of the many things that came out of these atrocities was that these um, the Nazi uh, prisoners were obviously not consented. Uh, they were not treated as human beings. They were subject to terrible experimentation. Um, and so one of the primary principles that came out of that is that informed consent is an absolute and participation in research must be voluntary. So it must be up to the individual to decide whether or not they want to participate in the research. And the research has to be necessary and it has to be based on prior animal experimentation. And the risk has to be proportionate to the importance of the research study. 
and there must be no unnecessary physical or mental suffering and there has to be the ability to withdraw from participation at any time. So as I mentioned, this is, was intended to be an international standard. It was released in 1947, but there were many unethical research studies that continued um, even after this document was released, which is uh, really unfortunate. Um, it, this is a whole other lecture all on its own, talking about some of the atrocities in human research over the years, um, US and Canada both. So if you're interested, I can certainly provide you with more literature on what some of these uh, what some of these cases were. But I just wanted to highlight today some of the some of the um, the most important um, sort of groundbreaking documents that came out of these these uh, uh, terrible experimentations. Uh, the Declaration of Helsinki was released by the World Medical Association in 1964, and um, it was meant to provide guidance to physicians conducting research. So it states that medical progress is based on research and that research improves treatments and understanding of disease, but it's not without risks or burdens to participants. So therefore, it must be subject to ethical standards. So it's got multiple sections, the Declaration of Helsinki, um, and it talks about the importance of having a well-designed protocol, that within the protocol, there needs to be a statement that the protocol is will be conducted consistent with the Declaration of Helsinki. So you'll find in every one of your clinical trial protocols that this statement is there that this, uh, this trial, this study will be conducted in accordance with the Declaration of Helsinki. That there must be independent REB review and it must be initial and ongoing. So it came, the Declaration of Helsinki was released in 1964 and you sort of saw the evolution or creation of research ethics boards or IRB starting in the early 1970s. And this I think was, was in response to uh, the release of this declaration. That the well-being of subjects overrides the interests of science and society. I and mean, we saw that certainly was not the case in, um, in Nazi, Nazi war times. Um, they, you know, sub subjected prisoners to experimentation to determine whether or not, for example, um, the effect of extreme weather on their soldiers. Um, but, you know, that's... Anyway, it's just some. It's it's really interesting to do a, a little bit of a deep dive into what what those sort of experiments um, were and and you know where it kind of sits overall in, in society now. It's just it's it's probably a good idea to take a look at that because it's certainly uh, subject interest was not even considered. Um, the voluntary and informed participation is absolutely necessary. That participants' privacy needs to be protected, and we need to ensure that we handle their information in a confidential manner. That there are informed consent requirements, and that there are also publication requirements. So the Declaration of Helsinki made provision for consenting of substitute decision makers because they recognized that in the Nuremberg Code, it said participant consent was of the utmost importance. And so individual participants who could not consent on their own behalf then would be unfairly excluded from participation in research. So the Declaration of Helsinki addressed that and put sort of requirements around what that would look like if um, a participant could not provide consent on their own behalf for one reason or another. The Belmont Report was released in 1979. Uh, the Belmont Report was really partially in response or prompted by the Tuskegee study, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, ran from 1932 to 1972. And Tuskegee involved um, it was a longitudinal study and it was looking at the effects of syphilis of 
men in Alabama. Um, and essentially, they were never informed of the availability of penicillin to treat syphilis when it became widely available. And so these people were enrolled in the study because the researcher wanted to see what untreated syphilis did. Um, so when penicillin came out, he's like, well, that will probably that's going to affect my study. Um, I'm not necessarily going to tell them that it's available. So uh, that was one of the greatest American tragedies was the Tuskegee study. So these participants in the study went on to infect their partners and they had suffered devastating effects from this untreated disease. And they actually were issued a congressional apology by President Clinton um, back in the 90s. And so what the Belmont Report establishes is these three foundational ethical principles, which is respect for persons, beneficence, and of course, non-maleficence, um, and justice. So it was released in 1979, and it I call this, it's sort of the American equivalent to our tri-council policy statement. So this is what the consent form for the Tus Tuskegee study looked like. So of course it was, uh, you know, vulnerable disadvantaged men in Alabama. And so the consent form, you know, just basically said that you were given a thorough examination. Um, you're now get your last chance to get a second examination. Um, and after this is finished, you'll be given special treatment if it is believed you were in a condition to stand it. I don't know what that meant because they weren't actually given any treatment. Um, so they just said, you know, you'll, you'll come in and you'll see a nurse and, uh, you know, you could be treated for bad blood. That's what they called it. Um, so it's just an example. And we can see now how it's evolved to really um, reflect you know, some of these horrible things that happen to to these, you know, these people who are, um, you know, unfairly treated in research studies in the past. So, um, I mean, now we may be overcompensated with 25 and 30 page documents written by legal departments, but um, the most important thing for research is that people understand what it is that they're getting involved in. They understand what the risks are, and they understand that this is something that they don't have to do and that they can withdraw anytime. And the TCPS2 is the Canadian counterpart to the Belmont report, and it talks about research, you know, really is a step or a foray into the unknown. And because its research really seeks to understand something not yet known, it comes with risks to participants and to others. And these risks can be significant. Um, they can be physical, psychological, individual, or social. And so because of this, we have an obligation to uh, ensure that we treat research participants with the utmost respect and to conduct research in a manner that minimizes risks and maximizes potential benefits. So the, the guidelines is based on those three core principles, which again, similar to Belmont is respect for persons, concern for well, well, welfare, whereas Belmont, Belmont calls it um, beneficence, and then justice. I want to talk about a little bit about how do we apply the ethical principles, because I think this is really important. Um, you know, what does respect for persons look like when I'm in the emergency department and I have I'm a research assistant, I have a consent form in my hand and I'm looking for a research study participant. How do I apply the ethical principle of respect for person? Well, what that means is you you you're applying it by actually getting informed consent. Informed consent is not only the signature on a document, it's having that discussion. So the informed consent discussion is, you know, what we're asking you to do, why it's important to do this research study, what your role is in it, what we're going to ask you to do, what your potential risks could be, and that you can how long you're going to be in it, what's your time 
commitment, what's your obligation, and what any risks, any potential benefits, and then how we're going to try to make how we're going to maintain your welfare throughout the study, what your ongoing monitoring is going to look like. So that's what respect for persons is, is that initial consent form discussion. It's clear and transparent informed consent. If there's any changes to your research study that might be significant for somebody on a research study to know that you bring that information back to them, have that discussion with them and ask them if they want to continue to participate based on this new information. Um, you know, the informed consent process is of the utmost importance. And we do know there are circumstances where individual informed consent can be waived, um, but those that's not necessarily for prospective studies, that's more for retrospective, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But that's how you demonstrate respect for persons, that ethical principle is through that informed consent process, initial and ongoing. And so I get asked a lot of times, do you think the REB will ask me to reconsent um, based on this informed consent change? And my response is always, is it information that they're gonna need or they're going to want to know in order to continue participating in the study? Is it something that they need to know? And if it's not, if it's an administrative change, like um, well, I had the question this morning, so that the study, we're actually, you know, extending the duration of the study um, and putting in a, an amendment to the consent form to change the dates. And I said, but does that change their participation in the study? No. And I said, well, then you don't you don't need to inform them because it's not going to impact their individual decision whether or not they want to continue. So that's that's what it looks like. Um, beneficence. So this is minimizing risks and maximizing maximizing benefits. So what it looks like in practice is sound research design. So risks in individuals is proportionate to the benefits to society. So you really, you know, this is why we have the methodology review to the HRPP um, is to make sure or help, you know, help you to contribute to sound research design. Um, I remember years ago, we used to do DVT or deep vein thrombosis interventional trials. And the gold standard back then was to do a venogram and nobody was doing venograms anymore. But that's what the regulatory authorities wanted to see as a kind of benchmark to establish whether or not this drug made a difference in, um, in preventing DVTs. And so, you know, the argument from the REB was, are we really going to ask people to accept, because a venogram is, was a hugely interventional study, it was very invasive, um, you know, diagnostic study to undertake. And so these are the types of things that, that we need to consider when we're, that the REB is looking at and balancing is whether or not asking somebody to do this, um, to assume this risk is going to contribute overall to, um, you know, the future improvement of care for, for society as a whole. So we're, we, we want people to assume risks and burdens, but is it going to be able to derive some, some kind of benefit that's going to, you know, potentially outweigh that risk and burden? And justice refers to the obligation to treat people fairly and equ equitably. So equity requires distributing the benefits and burdens of research participation in such a way that no segment of the population is unduly burdened by the harms of research or denied the benefits of the knowledge generated from the research. So this is uh, what this looks like is your inclusion criteria and your exclusion criteria and your recruitment process. Um, so, you know, re your recruitment process, are you using, are you maximizing um, the way that you would ask people to consider to participate? If you're using, uh, let's say social media, for example, and your target population doesn't have access to social media, so that are they being unfairly excluded? Um, because just simply because they don't know that they could have an opportunity to participate. Um, inclusion criteria, we really paying close attention now to uh, diversity in research. So there's equity and, and diversity. So ensure that anybody who may be able to participate has the opportunity to participate. And the RIB looks at this as well in the inclusion exclusion. So one of the things is 
financial means is anybody because they might have to um, you know contribute financially to to the study in some way is that going to um, unfairly exclude people just based on the fact that they wouldn't be able to pay for you know a medication to treat side effects or something like that so th these are the things that the REB looks like. So just to pay attention to those types of ethical principles when you're designing a study or when you're looking at participating in a research study, you know, um, are, you, are you maximizing the people, uh, your potential participants who could, um, you know, be able to take a look at the study and determine whether or not they want to take part in the, in the study. And just to add on financial, um, you know, with, with remuneration for research study, I know some people are like, mm, you know, we shouldn't be paying people to be in a research study, but you shouldn't all, you also shouldn't expect people to be out of pocket as a part of your research participation. So um, compensating people for parking, meals, accommodation, and things like that is completely acceptable. When it runs into the in, into the bit of a scary zone, I like to call it, is when you pay people or offer them an ins financial incentive that would be enough for them to park the risk. So if it's a if it's you know a, a big amount of money and they'd say you know what it's risky but I need the money so I'm going to accept it anyway. That's what the REB looks at and they they try to control that and put parameters around it because you don't want people to accept accept a risk that they would not normally accept. Um, other than the fact that they're being paid for it. Any questions on the application of ethical principles? And so you can see from historically where all of these things come from, right? So respect for persons informed consent is, is Nuremberg um, and Tuskegee. Beneficence, minimizing risk, again, comes back from Nuremberg. It's all tied back to these foundational ethical principles. And justice means to treat people fairly and, and equitably. Jacqueline? Sorry. Jacqueline. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I see a question from Carol. Go ahead, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to ask Jacqueline, while you're on the topic of, um, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it reimbursement, but that's not the right word exactly. We've been having a lot of discussions within our, our group right now about that because the study that we're embarking on um, is surveying patients and their families. And, and we were talking about you know, more and more, I, I find that we're expecting a lot of research participants and I would really like to compensate them for their time. So I, I guess where's that sweet spot? That seems to be what you're you're getting yeah. at. Yeah, it you're right. It is. And and you know, it, it's becoming more and more important to, especially as we embark on participant engagement in research, um, you know, and to make sure that they're fairly compensated for their time and contributions to the team. So I mean, I would have the conversation with them and say, you know, what what works best for you and in what format works best for you, and then submit it to to REB because I mean you never know what people are gonna say. I know they don't want to be out of pocket especially now for gas money and and things like that and for parking so even sometimes it's just as straightforward as that but um yeah i mean i think it's completely appropriate to have the conversation and say what what works best for you because we're more we're moving more towards that now instead of trying to be less restrictive and you know um especially in these you know, these kind of, and I don't want to minimize it, but I, I mean, lower risk studies, right? So, and it's all proportionate based on risk too. So it, it's something that's lower risk where you want to compensate them, be respectful of their contribution and their time. That's what I would say is, is talk to them and then come up with something um, and submit it to REB and say, this, this is based on what we heard from our participants. I don't know if that makes sense or if it helps. Yeah, I think so. I think that's that's basically what we were thinking is, I mean, obviously, we won't be able to talk to our participants ahead of time, but we can talk to potential right. participants right. and just gauge, you know, what what they think is reasonable or what they think might be reasonable for the time that they are going to uh, contribute, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And I would leave the language in the consent form. I, I know some sponsors, in, like drug companies, want want you to say, 
you're going to get $75. Um, but I think the language in our template is says says that you you know out of pocket expenses anything reasonable you know speak to the research team I would leave it at that so then you're not required to amend the consent form right with a yeah so it's just sort of a general statement that you know you you maybe yeah yeah something yeah. we'll come up with something thank you for your yes thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. No, it's it, it's a great question, and it's um, yeah. But again, it it all goes back to risk, and you sh people shouldn't like you wouldn't give them enough to for them to park a risk that they wouldn't or accept a risk that they wouldn't normally accept. Yeah. So some of our other compliance requirements. So uh, because we're um, in New Brunswick, we're under FIPA, which is the per the Personal Health Information Protection and Access Act. And so there is a section in FIPA that speaks specifically to research, and that's section 43. Um, and I know this section better than I wish I did, but I um, because I do the, the privacy reviews as well. And I have a, I have a certification in privacy, but as I always say, it doesn't mean I'm an expert, it just means I have a kind of a basic understanding of privacy principles. So when it comes in, when a study application comes into ORS through the Romeo system, this is one of the things that it's evaluated against the section 43. So um, again, it sets out parameters. So an approval under this section is conditional on the person proposing the research project, um, entering into an agreement with the custodian in accordance with the regulations. So uh, the agreement is not to publish personal health information in a form that could identify anybody. Uh, to use the personal health information requested solely for the purpose of the approved research project and to ensure that the research project complies with the safeguards, um, with any safeguards. So this is where uh, Corinne would come in. If we're sending data external to the organization or sharing it external to the organization, um, then you would require a data sharing agreement uh, in order to do that if you're not doing a clinical trial, which already has a big 40 page clinical trial legal agreement attached to it. Um, so because we're custodians of health information, if we intend to use that information um, for a different purpose, because the information that we collect within Horizon, first and foremost, is to provide care when we propose to use that information for a different purpose, then we're required to enter into an agreement um, before that data or that information is sent anywhere outside of the institution. So not only do you need an agreement, you also need REP approval. Jacqueline, yes. we have a question from uh, Sri Jin. Go ahead. Yep. Um, I was gonna actually ask about the the second section of that uh, personal health information um, uh, section is uh, that part B. Uh, how would you actually verify that? Because you're you're uh, you're asking about uh, people's intent there, right? Yeah. So not to um, to use the personal health information for the purpose. Yeah, it's it says solely for the purposes, right? So how do you actually like verify that? Because you're really asking what's in people's heads there and their uh, hearts. Really. Yeah, so, well, I mean, you would you would see it's it, the purpose should match the objective of the research study. So when you do uh, a research study application, right, for REB review and approval, mm -hmm. what you would articulate within that is what's the objective of your research study. And so in order to meet the objective of the research study, I need to collect the following information. So that's how we would we would verify that one one of the ways to do it. So I don't I don't know if that helps because we wouldn't release information, right? Unless we had an REB approval letter and REB approval takes in all those considerations. So what's the objective of the study? What's the purpose of the study? And sometimes I have gone back to teams to say, are you, why are you collecting this particular variable? Because it doesn't seem to um, fit with the objective or do you really need it in order to fulfill the objective of your research study? And then you would also have a data sharing agreement in place if it's going outside of the organization. 
So I don't know, does that help, Sergeant, or does that answer your yeah. question? Yeah, actually, I have a second quick question now that you mentioned data sharing agreements, if I can bring that up too. Yeah, sure. Uh, you you said the data sharing agreements um, would be for organizations, um, like external organizations. Um, what if, would you need a data sharing agreement in, in place if you were working with um, uh, an, like an, another organization, but you're under the same umbrella organization? Uh, can you give me an example of? Uh, so let's just say like, um, uh, well, we work with, uh, like, uh, like with NB social peds, like, uh, yeah. under our umbrella, let's just say we wanted to do, uh, like, uh, we wanted to put a data sharing agreement in place with, uh, another, you know, like PCAP or something, another organization that's under NB social peds. Um, I'm, I'm guessing a data sharing agreement would be necessary there, right? Um, well, yeah, I mean, PCAP or PCAP and recap? No, social peds and yeah. I mean if it's if it's different and different custodians. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at who is the primary custodian and are you kind of under the same like you know, horizon. We don't need a data sharing agreement for internal, you know, sending data to internal horizon departments. But mm -hmm. GMB, we do. We have to do a data sharing agreement with GMB if anything's going to GMB and vice versa. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but anytime, like if you have a question whether or not a DSA is required, just reach out to us because we're happy to help. Either Corinne and I can answer your question for you because sometimes it's not always clear and sometimes it's not always clear to us, to be honest. Like we really have to dig into it a little bit more. And mm -hmm. I do work pretty closely with the chief privacy officer too. So if I, you know, I have gone to Kelly before and said, I'm not really sure if we need to do this. So um, yeah, we can always help you out with that. So, you know, don't, um, don't worry about it. If if you're not sure of the answer, we can certainly try to figure it out together. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so FIPA continued. So as I mentioned, clinical trial agreements include clauses ad addressing applicable privacy legislation. Um, consent forms need to be explicit on who has access to your information, what's being collected, where it's going and for how long it's going to be stored. And so I do know that sometimes Kelly Chase, who's our chief privacy officer within Horizon, has asked to see consent forms um, just to make sure that we're putting all that information in there. Um, so only de-identified personal health information is permitted to be disclosed outside of the institution. And again, that question goes back to what's de-identified. And I have done presentations on that before because it's not what you think it is. There's actually 18 qualifiers um, that need to be removed in order for something to be truly de-identified. Uh, so if you've got a date, if you say your date is de-identified, but you've got date of surgical procedure or date of admission, date of discharge, those are quasi-identifiers. And potentially uh, in combination with any other like um, initial or date of birth or something like that could be um, re-identifiable. So we just need to be really careful about that. Uh, be careful of screening activities. So if you're looking for potential research participants, um, you can't access personal health information if you're outside of that circle of care to determine whether or not somebody's eligible to, uh, to be enrolled in a research study. So um, some departments have managed this by having um, you know, a consent form in place that's on the chart where either the administrative support in that area or um, a senior nurse clinician in the cardiac area gets a consent form to say, we do a lot of research here. Do you mind if one of the research team reviews your clinical record to determine whether or not you're eligible to participate? And, um, and they would say yes or no. So um, screening access to, you know, if you're a research assistant, and it's not normally within your scope to look at personal health information, then um, it's it's not permitted. It's not permitted by the act either. Um, there's a we've had a whole section on this as well, and there's actually a recording available. And if you want to take a look at it on privacy and research that our chief privacy officer did, we'd be happy to point you in the direction of that um, of that uh, presentation. 
Um, be careful when sponsors request you to scan copies um, or upload copies. Make sure it's redacted. Um, redacted means taking out their identifying information, their name, even their physician, who their physician is, is considered identifiable information according to the Act. So you take out name, physician, Medicare number, all those types of things that are that are pre-populated in a label because the sponsor doesn't actually receive identifiable information. Monitors come into the institution and they look at your information, participant information, and they see it um, fully identifiable, but sponsors don't receive identifiable information. If you're doing your own research project, always follow the least principal rule or the rule of minimums for personal health information. If it's not going to contribute to your data pool or your data analysis, don't collect it. Um, if you have a clinical care database, create a research database that's de-identified and you can connect it back through a study ID number. So you connect it back to the main clinical database by using a study ID number, but don't put identifiable information in your research database or in your data collection. And I've seen them come in data collection tools, participant name, and I had to go back and say, you know, you need to take that out and just replace it with a study ID number. Horizon also has overarching policies on privacy, which must be adhered to, and that includes a breach privacy. We've had research privacy breaches. They do happen. Uh, completely unintentional, but we need to follow the Horizon privacy breach process when those things occur. And you can always consult with research services on any privacy related issues uh, or privacy related questions because we've had to do privacy impact assessments before. Um, there are certain circumstances when a privacy impact assessment is required in research, and typically that's if. Uh, a privacy impact assessment is needed whenever you propose to do to collect or store information in a different manner from what you already do. So we recently did one. There was a group that wanted to create a research database that was um, had a vendor, external vendor to create it for. It. So it was an IT company created a database that was cloud based. So um, that's a different way that we normally collect or do a database within Horizon. We usually have them somewhere stored within within Horizon. This was proposed to be cloud-based and external to the institution, so we did a privacy impact assessment on that. And also a security review was done as well. Um, and researchers who collect personal health information, researchers are considered custodians under the Act. So therefore, you would be subject to all the requirements within the Act once you collect that personal health information um, for your research study under an REB approved research study. Question from Carol. Carol, go ahead. Yeah. Jacqueline, I'm going to put you on the spot again. Okay. I'm really interested to hear about the cloud based um, option. I know yeah. it was for one particular study that you reviewed that, but do you think that that might be an option for future studies, especially I'm thinking in the days now that we're collaborating with, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, no. people outside of Horizon, that is, would be so much easier. It would be, a, it, I completely agree. And, um, you know, and Stella can, can, we can talk to, talk about this is that we're looking at, so part of our strategic plan for research services and for research in general is to sort of modernize our clinical research operations and we're looking and working with IT um, to look at these cloud-based options um, because we're really we're really sort of challenged right now to try to keep up with other organizations are doing um, with respect to a, a number of things. So, yeah, it's definitely on on our sort of at the forefront because you're right, collaboration is important. And if we can't 
store data somewhere securely so that external collaborators can access it, it's going to make that really, really challenging for us to at least be a lead research center if we can't even off offer that that kind of um, that kind of option. So yeah, this was a one off and it was um, it's a vendor, so there's a cost associated with it. What we're looking at is trying to work with IT to come up with a system that's not going to, you know, that most teams could have access to. Uh, we're looking into REDCap as another one. So we've just started investigating REDCap. And, um, you know, the, there's a another sort of uh, timeline that's looming for us in March 2023 because we're tri-agency eligible, we have to have a data management plan in place. And so there's a movement towards having data accessible, right? So at the end of your study, you take your data, put it into some kind of a format and make it accessible to other research teams. So we at least have to have an initial plan in place by March 2023 to say that we understand that and that we're moving in that direction. So yeah, it's right now it's it's piecemeal, but we're trying to move more towards, um, you know, having certain options in place. And REDCap, I think, Stella, I think we're sort of re actively looking into REDCap again, right? Because Red, you yes, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are definitely working with that, and uh, also getting some. Um, there are a couple of institutions in, uh, across Canada that have implemented REDCap internally and have been using it quite some time. So we're getting some feedbacks from that group to bring it and make it use, utilize it in our, our, our organization. And uh, we're looking in different SOPs and setups that are required and things like that. So there's a lot of movement happening for that, for sure. Yeah, yeah. you'll see some changes probably. Yeah. yeah, that's really exciting. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yep. So stay tuned, I guess. <laughs> so just to, to summarize, um, our compliance requirements when we undertake the clinical trial, I mean, it's, it's fairly extensive. And if you really, you know, sometimes I think if I really, you know, sit here and pay attention to it, it can be a little scary. But, you know, I, I know all our teams are you know, are, are really dedicated and the number of people that attend training sessions like this, there's truly a keen interest. So, you know, we're forever grateful to our teams who, um, you know, who go out there and every day and, and work with these participants and knowing what kind of regulations. And this, these are not just like guidelines, right? These, this is law. So you're operating under this law every day. Um, so, you, you know, you have your GCP R2, and that's applicable to all phases of research, one through four. Um, Health Canada, that applies to phase one to three. We've had numerous Health Canada inspections here, um, and we've, you know, we've done well through all of them. And I just made a notation there to look at Guide 100, so that Guide 100 will help you um, to apply, you know, what, what the requirements of Division 5 Part C. The Natural Health Products Part 4, the Medical Device Regulations Part 3, the MDR Part 3, and we know now that Health Canada is implementing an inspection program, which will probably roll out within the next year or so that they've conducted pilot inspections of sites in every province that had an ITA or an investigational testing authorization. So if we're doing medical device studies, we're going to be um, even under more scrutiny to under the MDR regulations under their inspection program. The Tri-Council policy statement. So we know Horizon is a tri-agency eligible organization, so we're obligated to, to follow TCPS2. The OHRP is the Office of Human Research Protections. Um, we're, we're subject to those as well, having um, being you know, part of studies that are funded by DHHS or the Department of Health and Human Services. And for the FDA is to, as well, when we sign off on a 1572, so we're following um, or subject to the FDA regulations as well. Now I'm going to say this out loud and it'll probably happen tomorrow, but we've never had an FDA inspection and FDA sort of backed off a little bit on Canadian inspections when Health Canada started to do their own. So I'll let you know when they notify me tomorrow that they're coming. Um, so just 
a little bit of a closer look at the regulations. So Health Canada, the Division 5 came into effect in 2001. So that applies to all clinical trials involving new investigational drugs or marketed drugs when they're used outside of the marketing approvals. So it can be a little tricky. I know I've consulted with Health Canada before to say, you know, the investigator is saying that it doesn't need a CTA or a clinical trial application. I'm not so sure. So they do have a consultation process. They will help you out to determine whether or not you actually need to do an application. And as I mentioned before, uh, Division 5 adopts the principles of ICH GCP. The focus on these regulations is on the sponsor. So whoever is na who's ever name is on the clinical trial application, that's who um, is responsible for ensuring that they comply with all sections of um, Part C of Division 5. So a CTA or a clinical trial application submitted to Health Canada, they have an obligatory 30 day review time, turnaround time, at which point they will issue or the minister's office will issue a no objection letter. So what that means is we have your stuff, you're good to go, um, as long as you have REB approval. So the no objection letter is the sponsor's responsibility. They need to follow up on it and make sure that they have uh, no this no objection letter in hand. There is something in the guide to say if they don't hear from Health Canada within 30 days, they can say that can be considered the green light and the go ahead. I don't know that I necessarily um, do that as a sponsor. I think I'd want to have the no objection letter. That is the case in the States from the FDA. Um, but Health Canada's, I don't know, I think I'd want my no objection letter in hand if I was a sponsor. The natural health products part four, we don't, we haven't done any NHP product research here. I've been here, I don't know, a thousand years and I've never had an application for uh, under part four. But if it did, it uh, doesn't apply to trials um, using natural health products for the intended to, to discover or verify effects of NHP in humans. Again, the focus is on the sponsor and it does adopt um, the good clinical practice principles. And then we just talked about the medical device regulations part three. In 1998, they came into effect and it applies to all medical devices imported or sold for investigational testing. And the focus is on the device manufacturer and their obligations to obtain authorization from Health Canada. So an ITA, which is an investigational testing authorization, is required for all class two, three, and four medical devices. So operating under CTA, clinical trial application requirement, that you will comply with GCP, and that submission and approval of changes to the protocol, amendments and revisions are done, that the drug is labeled specifically for the trial and in French and English both, the investigator's signature on the QIU, which indicates their agreement to perform the trial in accordance with GCP. Notification of premature discontinuation of the trial, if that happens, you have to let Health Canada know. You need to report serious adverse events within certain time frames. And Health Canada may and will inspect sponsors and or sites that are part of the trial and that you will um, comply with Section 12 of the regulations with respect to your record keeping and data retention. Um, it also requires that protocols and any changes to them, including the informed consent, must be approved by a research ethics board. And the, the composition of the REB is defined in the regulations as well. It states that the REB chair must sign an attestation, which agrees to follow Health Canada regulations. Um, every approval letter that you'll see from our REB has this big statement on the bottom of it. Oh, that statement is in lieu of the, or the REBA or the Research Ethics Board attestation. So if the sponsor gives you a REBA, you don't need to submit it because we have that statement on the bottom of your final approval letter which also now includes a COVID-19 statement, um, which we had to make that change during COVID, um, during, uh, yeah, because Health Canada made revisions to their regulations um, through an interim order, which is why we had to make that change. But now we're also gonna have to include the medical device regulations too, because um, those, are, those are upcoming and 
our REB does review trials involving medical devices. And um, I also must record REB re refusals to approve a protocol or changes to a protocol. Those must be reported to Health Canada. And again, I refer you back to, uh, to Guide 100. Just put Google Health Canada Guide 100. It'll come up and it'll tell you um, specifically what, what Health Canada is looking for. So the effect of COVID-19 on Canadian regulations, it was uh, it was kind of interesting because I mean the, the regulations were pretty rigid, rigid and inflexible um, prior to COVID-19. Um, but what it did, they so they enacted an interim order. I think it was back in May 2020 or May 2021, and a couple of things that they did was they said that the no objection letter turnaround time would be decreased from 30 days to 14. And they also made changes to the informed consent process, which carried across all studies actually that were under Health Canada regulations. So we could do remote written consent and um, we could also do non-written informed consent so they put parameters around it because GCP and both regulations required a wet ink signature. And so we recognize that this was not possible um, because a lot of times patients were on isolation and those types of things. So they, they did permit the, uh, the alteration or deviation to the wet, wet ink signature. An interim order has been repealed and replaced by legislation that came into effect on February 27th, 2022. So it continued with the with the 14 day no objection letter for COVID-19 studies. And I think it maintained, yeah, it did maintain the alteration and in the informed consent as well. Um, any questions on that? So the our HRPP guidance document that we put out details, I just want to go back to the informed consent, um, alterations in the informed consent process. So if you have any questions on, on how to do that, just, just let us know. We'll be happy to help you out with that. Um, the intent is really to minimize, you know, at the height of the pandemic, and then we're still in it. We're still, you know, operating under, uh, I think, our code orange, level orange within Horizon. So we're still very tentative about you know, face-to-face -face contact to minimize that as much as possible, to tie visits into standard of care visits as much as possible, to do things remotely where possible. Um, and, and it's, again, it's that risk-benefit thing. So when we halted the recruitment to non-interventional trials, that was based on a risk assessment. So do you really want to bring participants out into society and into an environment that could potentially expose them to a deadly virus so that they can, um, you know, whatever the study was, complete a, a survey or questionnaire or something like that. So all of those decisions were in consultation uh, with REB and, um, you know, sort of based on the best available information that we had at the time. Uh, so I move on to preparing for REB submission. So we know we have our Romeo platform, our online online system now. And as I mentioned way back when we first started, that REB applications come in to the Office of Research Services first as part of the upfront initial review before it goes to REB. So. There's only one application needed. Um, at least it minimizes, you know, that kind of administrative uh, burden that way. Because some other institutions that have similar operations, I don't think are are set up the same way that we are. Um, but when you're preparing for an REB submission, it's really important to identify who your team members are. If you're doing invest, if you're doing a pharmaceutical sponsored clinical trial, um, who's your sponsor? Who's your principal investigator? Your research coordinators um, and your impacted departments. I have REB there, but I mean, we have one REB, and you're under our jurisdiction, so you don't really have an option there. 
make sure that you've got your, your training completed. Uh, so TCPS2, TCPS2 just updated their core tutorial in January 2022. Um, so TCPS2 training doesn't necessarily need to be updated once you have it, unless there's a change. Um, so because there has been a change, the new core tutorial really should be completed. And because we are a tri agency eligible institution, we're also an accredited HRPP, uh, through a standards or through uh, HRA Canada, we'll be looking more and more for completed TCPS2 certificates for every research study applicant. Um, if you're doing a regulated trial, GCP, so if, if you're doing a study with a sponsor and it's phase one through four, you need to do GCP training because GCP is still applicable to phase four, even though there isn't a clinical trial application. Um, so I think it's section 83 or something, the regulations don't apply, which speak to um, doing a clinical trial application, but every other component of GCP applies. And your Health Canada training as well. And that's uh, your Division 5 training. So GCP and Health Canada training are available through our city program. And if you need the link to that, we can certainly send that to you. And TCPS2 is free. You just have to Google TCPS2 core tutorial and it'll come right up. And you can access it. Um, for initial full board REB approval, submit all the required information and documents to the REB. Um, so if you want to look at what's required, there's a list on the REB application in the Romeo system. Uh, I talked about no objection letter before. The no objection letter is not required at the time of submission as long as we know that it's in process. So, and that goes for amendments too. So we don't need to know, or we don't need to have it at the time, but before the sponsor and the site is able to give you a green light to start, it's actually the sponsor, before they can give you a green light to start, you need to have that no objection letter. And so, um, you know, either submit it post initial review or with amendments once you receive it, but you'll see, Sometimes when I do reviews, I'll go back and say, is there a no objection letter or will there be a no, a no objection letter to accompany this? And if you have it at the time, try to make sure that you keep everything together with that one sort of initial approval or one, one event, just so that um, that entire sort of incident uh, is all kept together in the Romeo system. Um, I put this in here, uh, consult with research services on consent form content. Um, I do privacy reviews on the consent form. I will sometimes help out too with, you know, different formatting or picking out, you know, things that might be of concern to the REB. This is not mandatory, but if you want me to take a look at your informed consent document, just to say, you know, do I have everything here according to REB? REB is always going to come back with risks that they want reflected. Um, we do have a template as well that you can use, but by all means, if you want me to have a look at your informed consent form, I don't mind looking at it. I'd actually be happy to look at it um, in advance. I know that's an extra step when you're working with sponsor. There's like time, timelines, get it in, get it into REB. So I, I get it, but if you want me to look at it, I'll try to turn it around as, as quickly as possible. Um, consult with research services on contract and budget review. So we do try to flag within the Romeo system if a DSA is required or if a CTA is required. But if you're not sure whether or not you need a contract, always go to Corinne Warren and um, I provided her contact information at the very first. Um, she'll be able to help you out negotiate that. And so Corinne is actually, the RB has delegated the responsibility of contract review to the Office of Research Services. So we do all that contract negotiation for you um, through Corinne's office. And there is a Romeo manual on Skyline. Um, if you're not on Skyline, if you don't have access to it, just let me know and I can send it to you because it walks through um, every sort of step with initial submission, with amendments, submissions, and all those types of things. So I, within the Romeo system, one of the things that comes up a lot is you know that and we know that like we all know that the research coordinators do all this stuff 
for your PIs. Like they, they barely see it. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And so years ago, it used to be that um, you don't have a wedding signature because we didn't have an online platform. The way Romeo is set up is that your principal investigator needs to log in for that initial REB submission and hit the submit button. So that's kind of our way of saying that, yes, we know the PI is aware and is taking responsibility for the submission of this protocol to ORS and REB. Once you have, if you have conditional approval from the REB, it's not final approval, they have to log in again. So you make your amendments and they have to log in again and hit submit. Once you have final approval and your study is, is status changed active, then any member of the research study team um, that's listed in the Romeo system can go in and make uh, submissions uh, to that file on behalf of the principal investigator. Signature is not required. If you're on if you're on the study team, then we assume that the PI has delegated you that responsibility to submit those regulatory documents. Oops. So team member responsibilities. So a sponsor, that's your Merck or your Sanofi, if it happens to be in a clinical trial, they are responsible for the initiation management and, and or financing of the trial. Your team on the ground, the principal investigator, they're responsible for proper conduct of all aspects of the trial. Uh, they need to be qualified through education and training. They need to provide medical care. Um, they need to comply with GCP and all the relevant regulatory requirements. They need to permit monitoring and to supervise qualified staff to whom responsibilities have been delegated. Um, providing medical care, I just want to focus on that because the um, inclusion exclusion criteria. So that, especially for a, a drug trial, that would be considered a medical decision. So if somebody's eligible for a study and they need to have a diagnosis of X, that's a medical decision. So that needs to be under the purview or the auspices of your principal investigator. Um, you can certainly go in and do some initial screening for sure, but the, the actual decision as to whether or not somebody meets that inclusion criteria, that's a medical decision. Uh, research coordinators. So research coordinators, we all know, are the backbone and the functional component of research studies, uh, clinical trials in particular, and are charged with the responsibility of submitting to REB, maintaining those regulatory documents. So the regulatory documents are amendments, their uh, DSMB letters, their notifications to investigator, non-local SAEs. All those types of things contribute to your you know, pile of regulatory documents. They are usually delegated the responsibility to get informed consent of research participants. You know, if you get a, uh, your research coordinator, if you're also a treating physician, you've got those two hats that you're wearing. So in order to mitigate that therapeutic misconception, um, a research coordinator certainly uh, more than um, appropriate person to get that informed consent. Uh, coordinator screen for research participants within you know, their appropriate access to personal health information purview, recruit participants, implement the protocol. So you're responsible for doing scheduling all their follow up visits and testing and all that kind of stuff. Um, for data collection, co collection, sorry, and entry to manage records management and to communicate with the sponsor. The REB and part of the HLPP, so the REB's overall responsibility is to protect the right, safety, and well-being of all trial participants. So they do consider qualifications of the principal investigator, and that's why um, they're asked to provide a CV, um, an updated CV, and they, they ultimately determine whether the research meets the relevant ethical requirements in order to proceed. And then the HRPP component um, the ORS component of the HRPP, we look at training to make sure training is current, that methodology is sound. We don't do this for clinical trials that have a no objection letter because that's part of Health Canada's process. So that would be uh, a redundant and a, you know, an unnecessary administrative 
sort of thing. Um, we only do investigator initiated or um, non-regulated clinical trials. And we also make sure that, that privacy regulations and requirements are met too. Your impact to departments, if you're doing a clinical trial, consult early. So I'm talking about pharmacy department. If you've got a regulated clinical trial and you need pharmacy to be involved, um, ensure that they have the applicable training on the protocol. What's their procedure for investigational product, receipt, storage, dispensation, and destruction? If there's something weird about your study um, or unique, maybe I should say, not weird, uh, if you need some kind of strange adaptive device that we don't normally use or um, if there's strange storage requirements, I would recommend as early as possible after you finish your feasibility assessment, have a conversation with pharmacy to say, is this really something that we are able to undertake? Same with the laboratory. Um, lab does all your specimens at least they do here in st john so they need a copy of the lab, lab manual to figure out is this something that we're we can undertake now do we have capacity can we do it and diagnostic imaging that's the same sometimes with diagnostic imaging the imaging staff needs to be trained on the protocol because there are certain specifications that they need to capture so have a conversation with them and say, here's the DI manual. Is this is this some? Do we have capacity? Do we have like, um, you know, uh, we had a 1.5 MRI. Do we have a three MRI? And if we don't, can can we do it? So it's uh, it's really important to have the conversations early. Identify who it is that you're going to need to engage with in order to do your study, and then um, we also have a CAA process too for um funding and that's the cost analysis and assessment that's a form that needs to be filled out to send to these each, each of these individual departments so i would probably try to make sure that you have at least agreement in principle from these departments before you submit to reb because you don't want to run into snags or issues once you have reb approval so hrpp is only going to help you identify who needs to be involved um, but you need to operationally, you need to talk to these departments and figure out what kind of obstacles could I potentially run into that I can mitigate now before it even goes to REB. Another suggestion I would make is do a mock patient. So if you're new to this study, do a mock patient, run them through and just kind of identify where sort of potential roadblocks you're going to run into. So these are some of the references that I've used today. <clears throat> and you're going to and these are the ones that we need to be compliant with. Um, so how to meet the requirements in the application. So um, the references that we talked about meeting the requirements are following the TCPS2, Division 5, it's a regulated drug trial, GCP if it's a drug trial, phase one through four. Personal Health Information and Privacy Act is, is um, applies to all research study applications re regardless regulated or non-regulated. Um, the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations, Title 45, Part 46, and the FDA as well. 